Located in south central Indiana, 4 miles, 6.4 kilometers west of Edinburgh, 12 miles, 90 kilometers north of Columbus, and 30 miles, 48 kilometers south of Indianapolis, Indiana. It serves as both military and civilian training posts under command of the Indiana National Guard, but is used by all military branches. It has been used for a long time for training exercises with the United States Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, and National Guard branches. The camp will be mottoed as Preparamus, we are ready, a made-up word mainly as an old and odd attempt by the persons to give the camp a motto, serving as a post for military and civilian alike. Following the start of the U.S. War Department's order of military training centers to be built across the United States to bolster servicemen numbers as America entered the Second World War in 1941, the Hurt Engineering Company surveyed various acres of land to find a spot for a camp in south-central Indiana to house at least 30,000 trainees. The location was chosen due to its equally hilly and flat terrain, good for training conditions and European-style combat. And it was also near various urban areas, which were various portions of Bartholomew, Johnson, and Brown counties. In January 1942, a mere month after Pearl Harbor had been attacked by the Empire of Japan, the War Department got to work building what would be Camp Atterbury. Civilian contractors built the camp over a period of six months, from February to August in 1942. Initial land acquisition for the camp encompassed at least 40,000 351.5348 acres and 643 tracks and cost $3.8 million, about 63644871.17 dollars today. The camp would be named after William Wallace Atterbury, born January 31st, 1866, and had passed away on September 20th, 1935, a brigadier general in the U.S. Army during America's time in the Great War. With the camp opening back in June, it began taking thousands of new recruits to begin training. Facilities were built to provide water, sewage, electricity, and whatever other basic needs to the camp, as well as construction of a spur of the Pennsylvania Railroad adjacent to the camp. The camp's training facilities also included 21 firing ranges and about 30 buildings arranged as a small town dubbed Tojoburg to provide soldiers with field practice in a village setting. During the war, the camp at least had 1,700 structures, being barracks, officers' quarters, warehouses, mess halls, post exchanges, chapels, theaters, indoor and outdoor recreational centers, as well as administrative buildings, plus a library and a post office. There were at least 44,159 troops there at the camp during the war. Atterbury also included a large 1,700 bed hospital, 75 acres, 0.30 kilometers squared out of the land. Initial construction included 43 two-story buildings for patient wards, treatment facilities, mess halls, post exchanges, auditoriums, and recreation centers, as well as housing for various medical officers, enlisted men, and nursing staff. 31 of the concrete block buildings had interconnecting corridors with ladder expansion and remodeling. The facility evolved into 6,000 bed hospital in Compilation Center. In January 1942, a medical training school was established at Camp Atterbury, and as demand for its services increased, the hospital was further expanded and remodeled. In August of 1942, additional buildings were erected to provide space to train field hospital units. In April of 1944, when the post hospital was designed as a specialized general hospital for treatment of soldiers wounded in combat, it was under the command of Colonel Haskett L. Connor. The facility included at least 2,000 more beds for hospital patients and a separate rehabilitation center for 3,000 convalescing soldiers. On the 8th of May in 1944, the hospital had been renamed to Wakeman General Hospital in honor of Colonel Frank B. Wakeman, a New York native. In July of 1944, the Women's Army Corps Medical Department Enlisted Technician School was relocated to Camp Atterbury from Hot Springs, Arkansas. In a little more than a year, an estimated 3,800 WACs received their medical technology training at Wakeman Hospital. Some of them remained at Camp Atterbury after their training, while others continued their service at other U.S. hospitals. 
In late 1944 and early 1945, the hospital and convalescent centers facilities were further expanded and remodeled in anticipation of an increase in demand for its services. Effective 5th of April 1944, the 3,547th service unit replaced the WAX and medical section of the 1,560th service unit. On the 18th of August, the hospital received its first casualties from England and France. The wounded mainly arrived by plane from Atterbury Army Airfield and about 12 miles away by train. At one point during the Second World War, Stanley Barentain was at Camp Atterbury. After being in the Army for a while and being a trained artilleryman, he was sent to join the artillery regiment of the 106th Lionhead Division, joining a five-man crew on a 105-millimeter howitzer, and had been a while stationed at Camp Atterbury. After passing out due to a medical incident during training, he was rushed to Wakeman General. During his time there, he would doodle on notes, and it would start his career of art towards what would be later the Berenstain Bears. He was lucky enough to have the incident occur as his unit it was out in Europe. His unit had gotten caught up during the German Ardennes Offensive in late 1944, which the 106 were nearly wiped out. He drew sketches of the camp, including of the infamous rubbish heap near the hospital bellowing smoke from smokestacks. When doing a picture of the Mad Russian, a wrestler of the time, Colonel Blocker had seen him sketching while he toured the Army's hospital's maxillofacial plastic ward with Captain Menza, his surgeon. A conversation occurred between the two men, which actually got Stanley into medical sketching. That's pretty good, son, said the colonel. Thank you, sir. Are you a queasy type of fellow? Beg your pardon, sir. Can you stand the sight of blood? I don't know, sir. I've never seen any except my own. Well, we're going to find out, because I'm founding a maxillofacial center here at Wakeman, and you're going to be my medical artist. Stanley ended up being promoted from private to T5, and was ended up joining a medical groupment for medical sketches. In 1942, it was decided that the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps would be sent to Atterbury. They worked in a separate army area of buildings. 130 personnel came in March. 1943, being the 44th Headquarters Company under the command of 2nd Officer Helen C. Grote. Another contingent soon came later that month of 141 women under the command of 2nd Officer Sarah E. Murphy. An all-black unit, along with the white unit, performed various training and medical tasks at Wakeman as part of the 3,561st Service Unit. A special battalion, the 101st Infantry Battalion under the command of Colonel Vincent Conrad, was organized in 1942, dubbed the Austrian Battalion because various servicemen had been refugees from the German annexed Austria. This included three Archdukes who were the sons of Charles I of Austria and the brothers of Otto von Habsburg. Soldiers who remained at Camp Atterbury for an extended period of recovery were housed in barracks in the camp about two miles from the hospital. Wake remained under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Ray M. Connor followed by Colonel Frank L. Cole in 1945, Colonel Paul W. Crawford in January of 1946. The Catalyson Center was under the command of Colonel Harry F. Becker. Wakeman treated an estimated 85,000 patients during the war. It would close at the end of 1946 after the remaining patients were transferred to other hospitals. The WACs were then relocated to San Antonio, Texas. Colonel Welton M. Modisset served as Atterbury's first post commander in May of 1942. Brigadier General Ernest A. Bigsby succeeded Colonel Modisset as post commander in June 1945, when the camp was active reception and separation center. Colonel Herbert H. Glidden succeeded General Bigsby in June 1946, following in August by Colonel John L. Gamet, and then Colonel Carter A. McLennan in September. Colonel McLennan was Camp Atterbury's commander when it was shut down for a while in December of 1946. During the entirety of the war, and even into the modern age to a degree, the camp would be carried on and off by the 6th Army Corps and the 5th Army, both respectively caring for the camp. Between 1942 and 1944, four U.S. Army Infantry Divisions would be trained and even at times created at the camp before being deployed. The 30th Old Hickory Division 
Under the command of Major General Leland S. Hobes, the U.S. Army's 83rd Division, under the command of Major General John C. Milliken, the 365th Infantry Regiment and the 597th Field Artillery Battery, units of the 92nd Division, under command of Colonel Walter A. Elliott, and the 106th Golden Lion Division, under the command of Major General Allen W. Jones. The 83rd Division was the first infantry division to arrive for training, activated in August of 1942. It would leave in 1943 in June for further training in Tennessee and Kentucky, later being sent to England in 1944. The 365th Infantry Regiment and the 597th Field Artillery Battery were reactivated at Camp Atterbury in October of 1942, mainly being of African-American servicemen. The two units remained at the camp until April of 1943 when they joined the 92nd Division in Arizona, later being sent to North Africa and the Mediterranean in 1944. The 30th Old Hickory Division came in November of 1943. The division left on the 30th of January in 1944 from Massachusetts, later being sent to England in 45. The Golden Lion Division, the 106th, arrived at Atterbury in March of 1944, leaving in October. It was the most sized division to train at the camp. It would famously be sent to the Ardennes Forest on the French-Belgian border where it, along with other American units, would be caught off guard by the German offensive during the winter of December of 1944. While Kurt Vonnegut was at Cornell University, he was interrupted by America's entry into the war. I was flunking everything by the middle of my junior year, he admitted. I was delighted to join the Army and go to war. In January 1943, he volunteered for military service, but had slow entry due to ammonia. Eventually ended up as a battalion intelligence scout with the 106th Infantry Division, based with Atterbury. It was while he was there that he met and became friends with Bernard V. O'Hare, who joined Vonnegut as a prisoner of war in Dresden, Germany, one of inspiration to his later novel, Slaughterhouse-Five. Through 1943 to 1946, a prisoner of war camp was built as part of the Allied internment of various Axis POWs. The camp interned about 15,000 men, mostly being Italians and Germans. Most of them had been taken prisoner following the Allied invasions of Sicily and the Italian mainland back in 1943 and 44. The POWs did not arrive at the same time, however. The first group, mainly being Italians, arrived on the 30th of April 1943, and by September there were nearly 3,000. All Italian prisoners had been transported from Camp Atterbury by May 4th of 1944. The Germans began arriving on the 8th of May, 1944. About 5,700 were there by September. When the camp exceeded its capacity, some of them were relocated. By October, their numbers had reached 8,898. 3,700 of them were housed in satellite camps. The last prisoners to leave, mainly just Germans, leaving Wakeman Hospital, departed in late June of 1946 for New Jersey. The internment camp was under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John L. Gamble. Father Maurice F. Imhoff was assigned as the camp's chaplain. Seventeen POWs would end up dying at the camp. Prisoners were organized into three battalions, and the camp was divided into three sections with barracks, living conditions, health centers, etc. They worked as general camp laborers and as off-site locations under guard. They were paid 80 cents per day, in addition to 10 cents per dime from the U.S. government. All in all, the Italians were seen as the more favorable of the group, despite the fact that they themselves had grievances over each other toward their favors of Mussolini and his fascist policies. In 1943, Colonel John Gamble, now a lieutenant colonel, gave Italian prisoners permission to erect a small chapel about one mile, 1.6 kilometers from the internment compound. Dedicated to the Blessed Mother, it was dubbed the Chapel in the Meadow. It was built of brick and stucco from scrap material. The exterior had bright blue stucco walls and plain white columns. A cross surmounted the south end of its gavel roof. The east and west side walls each had an opening in the shape of a cross. Its interior was decorated with a fox painted marble after installed at the back. The chapel was not demolished when the camp was dismantled, but it would fall in disrepair and vandalization. The chapel was restored and dedicated in 1989. The Indiana Historical Society recreated a model of the chapel for its exhibit in 2017. 
The history of the rock sat at the east entrance of the post is back to when there were still Italians in 1943. The prisoners, being Roman Catholic faith, constructed their own chapel. This was also helped by the fact that most of the Italians had worked as stone cutters back in their homeland. Libero Puccini, an Italian prisoner, was one that carved the rock. The inscription, Camp Atterbury, 1942, and one that says Atterbury Internment Camp, 1537th SU121542, in reference to the U.S. unit guarding the compound. During the rocks unveiling ceremony, many members in the audience and of the military were shocked to have seen a dagger carved into it. It was known since the 15th century as a stiletto, a second-hand blade weapon of Italian knights, and as a symbol of Italian forces, such as the elite Arditi commandos from the First and Second World Wars. After leaving the camp and going back to Italy at the end of the war, Puccini returned to the United States and managed to become a citizen. He attended events, and after he was contacted in 1992, he was sent to re-education of the chapel. He was quoted as saying, everything now is a memory of a momentous past, and I have been quoted as saying that former enemies can become friends. My reality of that concept is my proud citizenship and marriage to a lovely American lady whom I met as a prisoner of war. Having resided in the United States for nearly 50 years, I am a proud father of three grown children and six wonderful grandchildren. Coincidentally, one of my sons now serves as a career officer in the United States Armed Forces. The Army would suspend operations at Atterbury in August of 1946. The War Department even made preparations to transfer Wakeman's remaining personnel to their hospitals. The camp wasn't closed. It just sat idle for a long time. It wouldn't train any more units until the 50s, when it was reactivated as a military training ground for upcoming American involvement in the Korean War. The 28th Infantry Division had arrived in September of 1950, and left in November of 1951 for the Federal Republic of Germany. In 1951, the 6th Army Corps was also reactivated there. The 31st Dixie Infantry Division also trained at Annaberry. When it departed for Camp Carson, Colorado in 1954, the camp was once again deactivated. Annaberry was stuck like this until the 1960s, when in December of 1968, the U.S. Army ended Annaberry's use. The Indiana National Guard took command in January of 1969, all the way from the 70s to the 90s. The camp took care of the National Guard during the Vietnam War, Operation Desert Storm, and the Gulf War, plus Operation Desert Shield. Originally encompassing about 40,352 acres, the camp was reduced to 30,000 acres. In 1969, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources leased more than 6,000 acres of land for the Atterbury State Fish and Wildlife Area. Future programs, such as the Job Corps and other countless things, plus counties such as Johnson County and the U.S. Department of Labor took over plots of land at random points of time. During the 1980s, various barracks and facility renovations were done to help modernize the camp as it was reaching the 21st century. In 1991, training was once again reactivated for the Gulf War and America's involvement in Operation Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, and American cooperation in Iraq, along with the transport of the 1,438th Engineer and Transportation Companies to support the supply chain for coalition forces. Finally, after reaching modern times after the 2001 September attacks by Al-Qaeda, it was given a kickstart for better National Guard training. The Camp Atterbury Joint Maneuver Training Center was activated in February of 2003. Many servicemen of various branches trained and were then sent from Atterbury to the Middle East, the Balkans, and various parts around the world. From 2009, Atterbury has trained thousands from the Interagency and U.S. Department of Defense in the DOD Civilian Expeditionary Workforce Program, as they for mobilization to perform stability ops in the Middle East, such as in Afghanistan and Kuwait. In 2010, renovations for new barracks were also made to ever modernize them. In June 2008, a tornado hit Camp Atterbury, damaging an estimated 40 buildings. There were at least two injuries that were reported. But despite the estimated multi-million dollar damage to the camp, training continued for more than 2,000 troops, including a U.S. Marine unit. 
Literally four days later, the Guard and U.S. Marines at Atterbury were then sent off to help with the June 2008 Midwest floods. In April of 2010, plans were announced to reclaim 1,200 acres, 4.9 kilometers squared of land for construction of Indiana National Guard offices, barracks, and other facilities. Reaching the modern day, at least for right now, depending on who's watching this, in 2021, with the end of America's war in Afghanistan, the camp now, along with training, possesses at least 5,000 Afghani refugees who had been forced to flee Afghanistan, fearing the new rule of the Taliban or having aided American forces. The first 1,000 arrived in September 1st. According to officials, refugees included American citizens, Afghani allies who helped in the military effort, and those deemed vulnerable Afghans by the U.S. government. With us now reaching modern day, Atterbury, as usual, is stable and does not seem to be tired to seize any operations at any time. 